Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. The purpose of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 3. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused, uh, in their hearts whether John and he were Christ or not John answered saying unto them I indeed baptize you with water uh, I need water somebody please if we can have water for me somewhere Nathan's got a baby over there <coughs> whether he were Christ or not John answered and said I indeed baptize you with water but one mightier than I Cometh the latch, thank you, whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. One of the biggest um, misnomers in the church today is that when you get born again, you have all the Holy Spirit that you'll ever get. Actually, we can prove for you from Scripture that there's a different or a subsequent experience in God to be the new birth, that is, being filled with the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, For by one spirit are you all baptized into one body, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, whether we're bond or free, we've all been made to drink into one spirit. And so here we have that Paul writing to the church at Corinth saying that um, Jesus, I mean, that the Holy Spirit will baptize us into Jesus. Yet, John the Baptist said of Jesus, he would baptize us in the Holy Ghost. There's two different things. You've got two different persons of the Godhead baptizing you into a different person of the Godhead. So they're not the same experience. Baptism into the body of Christ is the new birth. Getting saved. Coming to know Jesus. You're born again. Hallelujah. Jesus said that he would pray the Father and he would give us another comforter. that he may abide with you forever. Now the word another in the Greek is alios, A-L-L-O-S. It means one after the same sort as myself. Um, heteros would mean a different. Jesus didn't use the word heteros. He didn't say, I'll give you a different comforter. I'll give you another after the same manner as myself. The word comforter, you've, you've heard us say, teach us numerous times. It's pericle in the Greek, and it meaning comforter, advocate, helper, intercessor, strengthener, standby, teacher. So when Jesus told them he was going to send another like himself, not a different, but like him. Why? Because when he was with them in the earth, he was their advocate. He was their intercessor. He was their strengthener. He was their teacher. He was their comforter. Amen? He was um, their, their intercessor, their helper. He was all those things. But he said, I'm leaving. And then he goes on and says later, it's expedient for you that I go away for if I don't go away the comforter I believe we're in John chapter 15 the comforter will not come to you or the paraclete will not come to you the Holy Ghost has come let's look over in Acts chapter um, 1 now we know the church started when Jesus breathed on them and said receive ye the spirit Hallelujah. Brother Bill and I had discussions over that over the years. I came to learn he was right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 4 of Acts 1, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. Now, that's the third baptism. Baptism into the body of Christ, baptism in water, and baptism in the Holy Ghost. Okay? Uh, but for John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And we already read for 1 Corinthians um, that it says that they were to be baptized by the Spirit into the body or into Christ. That's the new birth. And um, 
goes on down verse 7, you shall know, uh, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father has put into his own power, but you shall receive power, dunamis, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And, uh, excuse me, good Lord. That's what happens when it's 13 overnight, the heat, heat systems kick in like crazy. It's warmed up. All right. So what's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? It is to empower the church to carry out its mission, to take the gospel to all the world. Now remember that um, <clears throat> Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, the 28th chapter, down around verse 17, 18, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. What's that word power? Exosia, all authority. Therefore, you go and preach the gospel. Then he comes to the church after the day of Pentecost, after, on the day, you know, um, before he's taken up to heaven before the day of Pentecost, saying, go in Jerusalem and tarry there until you receive dunamis. He's already given the church the authority, but they need the dunamis to back it up or to demonstrate the authority. Okay? So he tells them uh, in Matthew, I've got all authority, I give it to you, but now you go wait till you get the dunamis to work or to back up or to enforce the exousia, the authority. And so you can go carry the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. God is looking for a miracle church. God is looking for a church that, that goes out and carries out the great commission, that carries out and preaches the gospel, that has signs and wonders following the church. Amen. Can you say amen? And so, listen, sinners should, we should, be, sinners should get healed. Let me say this. Uh, usually it, it works, things work a little bit differently when we're, when we're preaching the gospel. God demonstrates signs and wonders. Believers are to walk by faith. Now we've spent much of our time trying to have healing services in the church to get the church healed. We should be out in the highways and byways getting the sinners healed. We want to have miracle services for the church, which is we need to so the church can see it in demonstration. But I'm telling you that we, that we should be seeing more out there than we ever see in here. Yeah. Going into the highways and the byways with the anointing and the power. Look at what they did throughout the book of Acts. I mean, Peter and John show up at the, at the gate called Beautiful, and, and they see a guy sitting over there, and he, and he says, look on, and, and, and the guy looks at them, and they say, look on us, he expects, and, and Peter goes, hey, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give out thee, rise up and walk in Jesus' name. Pow, up it comes. That'll upset theology. That'll mess up people's theology. Hello? Uh, he won't even serve in God. He got healed. Well, that's the, that's the problem. We, we got to understand God wants to work signs and wonders and miracles out there. Amen? And the baptism of the Holy Ghost is given to the church in order for us to carry out the Great Commission. Amen? And let, let men and women see in demonstration and manifestation the reality of the resurrected Christ. Hallelujah. T.L. Osborne, I remember him uh, sharing one time about his first missions trip. Now he became one of the greatest missionaries we've ever known uh, in the last century. And um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people came to Christ in his ministry. We probably guess going to the millions, but his first mission trip was a failure. Absolute fall on your face, mired in the mud, failure, flop. He went to uh, India, went to a region of the country that was heavily Muslim and uh, was preaching Jesus. And uh, they were coming up to him saying, why should we believe on Jesus? He said, because he's the son of God. No, we believe Muhammad is the prophet of God. He said, but the Bible says that Jesus is, is, is the way. They said, what the Quran tells us that Muhammad is the way. He said, he got desperate. He said, but mine has leather and gold edges. They said, ours has leather and gold edges. Thought it'd make it more, more real if it had leather and gold edges. And he left there a failure. Came home to America in, over in Oklahoma City. And just fell on his face in his living room and began to cry out to God. He had a heart to reach the masses. He had a heart to reach humanity with the gospel. And he had failed. And while he was, he, he, he was over on his back and 
uh, just crying out and talking to God about how he had failed and why he had failed and what, what was the reason. And Jesus appeared to him. He said Jesus didn't say anything to him. He just looked at him. And in that moment with Jesus standing there, a revelation came to Brother Osborne. I was preaching a theological Jesus and not the resurrected Jesus. And because I wasn't preaching the resurrected Jesus, the theological Jesus couldn't do anything for him. And so he packed his stuff up, went back to that same place, and had a revival, and started preaching Jesus heals, Jesus delivers, Jesus does the same thing today that he did when he walked the earth. And they uh, had, a, had, a, had a miracle, brought somebody up, had to pray for him, and Muhammad's name, nothing happened. He prayed for him in Jesus' name, they were instantly healed, and everything broke out. And from then on, he never preached a theological Jesus. He only preached a resurrected Jesus. The same Jesus that, that walked the shores of Galilee and, 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 and walked on the water and turned the bread, and, uh, you know, um, turned the water into wine and fed, fed the 5,000 with the fishes and the loaves and the weather calmed the storms. <clears throat> he preached. He was still walking today. He was still working today. He was still doing miracles today. Amen. Amen. Through the church, through his body, praise God. And people, and, and then he said, so Brother Osborne was, was, was really the original mass crusade guy. We hear about Reinhard Bonnke. We hear about different ones who've held a huge... Brother, Brother Osmond was doing it back in the 50s and the 60s and uh, remote places. <coughs> Mass crusades of 50,000 people and so forth. And, he's, and God showed him how to heal in the masses. He would just pray prayers over the whole crowd. And they would begin to bring up all their implements for, you know, stretchers and crutches and all these things and pile them up and burn them in the fields. Because they didn't need them anymore. Because they came in contact with Jesus. They came in contact with the miracle power, the dunamis of God. And see, the church needs to be baptized, immersed, uh, uh, covered in the Holy Ghost so that we have the dunamis of God working in us. So that when we go out, we're not just going out and trying to be cute and trying to out-argue somebody. There's a power in our life, glory to God. There's an anointing in our life, praise God. The Holy Ghost is working in us and through us, praise God. And miracles, signs, and wonders are taking place. That's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yeah, yeah, we have Holy Ghost services. We have wonderful services. We have times in the Lord. But let me tell you something. There's more and there's a greater depth to the reason of being baptized in the Holy Ghost than saying, I got it. I grew up Pentecostal. Yeah. And when you got the baptism, you say, I got it. You got what? I got the baptism. Yeah. Don't even go to church anymore. What I need to go to church for, I got it. God help us, uh, what brother you say, they're darling hearts and stupid heads. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, yeah, now you're finally ready. I said, now you're finally ready. Praise God. So God wants the church to be full of the Holy Ghost. And remember, remember when they chose out the uh, disciples in the book of Acts? They said, you know, they, they got upset because the Grecian Jews were murmuring. They weren't being ministered to. And the, the disciples got together and said, we can't leave the Word of God and take care of this stuff. You choose out seven men, what? Full of faith and the Holy Ghost to take. You had to be full of the Holy Ghost to feed the widows. They wouldn't even let you do, they wouldn't let you do anything. They wouldn't even let you feed folk without being full of the Holy Ghost. Wow. Wow. I can tell you a food line can get. You need the Holy Ghost. People can get whatever. They can get honorary. Amen. Hallelujah. So, um, you know, the, 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 the primary purpose is to get the church in position to carry out the great commission to win the lost. God wants, the, God's heart, number one, is the lost. Can I be real honest with you? He doesn't really give a rip about your stupid doctrines that you can lay around and do anything you want to and still go to heaven. And if that's all you're concerned about, you got the wrong heart anyway. He wants to reach the lost. Amen. Now, Praying in tongues. And when you get, born again, when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you get filled, get filled with the Holy Ghost. I spoke with tongues. And this, you know, you guys are, are um, versed enough in this. I'm not going to cover all that, okay, this morning. I'm not going to go into depth on that. <clears throat> but praying in the Holy Ghost gives us rest. With stammering your lips in another tongue while I speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest 
wherewith he will cause the weary to rest. Now remember, he quotes that over in the church, when he writes the church of Corinth. He says um, in 1 Corinthians chapter um, 14 verse 21, In the law it's written with other, with men, other tongues and other lips will I speak to this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. <coughs> he didn't quote the whole thing, but he says this is the rest. You'll cause the weary to rest. Not enough Christians are praying in the Holy Ghost because they're too tired all the time. Now we're talking about God wants to give you spiritual rest by praying in the Spirit. He wants to charge you up. Amen? So, you know, we get divine communication from the Father by praying in the Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 2. Follow after love. Desire spiritual gifts, rather that you may prophesy. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the Spirit. He speaks mystery. Divine communication with God takes place. How many people go around whining and complaining about the need to be able to talk to God? And they're not doing what they need to do to talk to God. Oh, if God would just talk to me. He said, pray in the Spirit. He'll speak mysteries with God. You'll commune with the Father. You'll have divine communication with the Father. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Look over at somebody on the other side over here. Look right at yourself. You can look at yourself and say, listen to what he's saying. Got these mirrors over here. Look at yourself. Point at yourself. Say, listen to what he's saying. Hallelujah. It's always one in the crowd. <laughs> what do you say? <sighs> Lord, help me. Got a classroom of clowns. All right, Jude, verse 20. You know, there's only one chapter. There's only one, so it's not multiple chapters. But ye, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. It's praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues. God wants you to stay charged up. God wants you to stay built up. God wants you to be ready for the, for the fights of life. Now listen, if we, go, if we rest... If we commune with the Father, if we build ourselves up, then what are we going to do? We're going to be ready to go take the gospel to the world. Amen? I said amen. Um, Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 17, wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk or intoxicated with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I, I, you know, folks, you've got to understand the, old, the New Testament was written in light of the old. In other words, there's things in the old. And have you ever gone back in Proverbs and saw where, uh, how much is spoken about wine being a mocker, that you pursue after it, it's going to bring you down, that it's destructive and all that kind of stuff? But you get some people running here, well, he just says, be not drunk. Why? That means I can drink if I want to, just as long as I don't get drunk. But you go back, let's see, this is written in light of the fact it's already been stated. It's a mocker. It'll entrap you. People look at the beauty of it and they get all, I mean, and now it's a great, I mean, it's, it's like everything. You got to go, you got to go paint and drink. Jamestown has a place where you drink and paint. Your wine and your art. They ain't there to paint. They're there to drink. It's just another excuse to do it, you know? Yeah, they, they go in there and they paint. They set up easels and they get wine. They drink wine while they paint. People are just all about drink. Churches advertise, we drink. It's a mocker. It'll bring you to destruction. Hello? We shouldn't have to be saying this in the church. I mean, but now everybody wants to find out how they can get away with stuff. They want to find out what they can get, get by with and still get to heaven. I don't want to find out what I can get by and get to heaven. I want to just get so full of heaven, I'm not worried about getting by. Amen? As a matter of fact, it's just a substitute for what God wants to give you. Be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. 
speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. What happens? <coughs> Being full of the Holy Ghost strengthens us. It empowers us. It strengthens us. It gives us spiritual strength for the battle. It gives us spiritual strength for the journey. Amen? Hallelujah. I think I need to close the vent over my bed. It's been drying my throat out. Um, past couple, about, about past week, it's been getting me some. So I apologize for the frogginess. We are to mainstain, ma mainstain, maintain spiritual strength by speaking and praying in the Spirit. Hallelujah. What's all this for? This is so we can be effective witnesses. So we can be effective at preaching Jesus. So we can be effective at going out and laying hands on the sick. Remember what's the Great Commission? Go back over to Mark's Gospel chapter, last chapter of Mark's Gospel. I'm going to bring my portable air conditioner down here. Mark 16, 14, after he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meeting up, braided them. That's rebuked them. Okay? And they sat at meeting up, braided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is appointed as one of the apostles of the church, these signs shall follow them. What? Sorry. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them until we get the canonicity of Scripture. Oh, sorry. Read it wrong again. These signs shall follow them until the last apostle dies. Y'all, what Bible y'all using? Oh, these signs shall follow them that believe. Who? Them that believe. Yeah, I know everybody goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, says that which is perfectly come, that which is in part should be done away with. Let me ask y'all something. They say that's the canonicity of scripture. Sorry. That's, that's not it. That's a stretch, and that's a human reasoning, and there's no other scripture to support it. And every word has to be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. How do you know it's not? Because John wrote and said, when, when he shall appear, we shall be as he is, for we shall see him as he is. What did Paul say? When that which is perfect is come, over 1 Corinthians, I will know even as I am known. John says, when he shall appear, we shall be as he is, for we shall see him as he is. He's talking about the, the return of Christ. Perfect cannot be the canonicity of Scripture, because I don't know even as I am known. I'm waiting for Jesus to show up to be able to be as he is, for I'll see him as he is. Okay? So these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils or exercise authority over demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Okay. We need to be going out into the world. We need to be laying hands on the sick. We need to be exercising authority over demons. Now, it doesn't mean you could pick up a bottle of strychnine and drink it. You're going to go to your cabinet and get the skull and crossbow thing. I go, whoop! If I drink any deadly thing, it won't harm me. Go, 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 go. And, um, We'll be asking your spouse or your loved ones, where do you want to have the services at? That's just stupid. Amen. Doesn't mean you go find you a rattlesnake and pick him up, Nathan. You'll go somewhere, Nathan, coming back. You know, they, call, they nicknamed him Snake, the baseball team, because he picked up Copperhead out of the coach's flower bed. His, the wife was watching him do it. He's walking around the. the, the It takes great faith to get some people through childhood. <laughs> well, he was 18, 19, 17, 18 years old. Like I said, it takes great faith to get some people through childhood. That's just a number. He was still a child. I love my buddy. But 
They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Verse 19, so the Lord had spoken unto them. He was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God. They went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them. What? Confirming the word with signs following. Well, what signs? Lay hands on the sick, casting out devils. I mean, Paul got on the island of Miletus and uh, went down to pick up uh, some sticks to put on the fire and a venomous viper laid a hold of him. And he just shook it off, went on and started doing his business. They all waited for it to swell up and die. After a little while, he didn't do that. Hallelujah. They wanted to hear what he had to say. And you could get a revival right there on the island of Miletus, or Miletus, Miletus. Um, depending on how you pronounce it. I'm Eastern Carolina. We, we are known for destroying words. <laughs> so here we are in the church. God wants us back. Listen, we, are, we, we know we're charismatic. We know that we've been filled with the Holy Ghost. But you know what? We need to keep fresh mindset about why. It's not so we can just run around and say, we're a charismatic church. Woo! Put it on our sign. Are you here? It's not just so we can have a sign that says we're charismatics. Or that we're word of faith. Or we're this. It is so that we can maintain that experience with God. And be effective tools in the hands of God to reach humanity with the gospel of Jesus. <clears throat> As we were coming in today, Janie, Shannon and I, not Janie, Jan, Shannon and I, we were coming in, and we came by the assembly of people who don't believe in anything. <laughs> Their belief system is that when you're 13, you decide what God is. And that's what you worship. If God is dirt, that's what you worship the rest of your life. I'm not really sure how they have sermons. Not sure how they can do anything. Because they don't believe in anything. They don't believe that Jesus is God. As a matter of fact, if you believe that, that God is the clouds, that's what you worship. Okay? Thomas dealt with that. Church history teaches us Thomas went down to Africa. And in Africa, they had a group of, of natives that worshiped. They would go out in the river and they would splash the water up in the air. And the crystals would get rainbows in them and they would worship the light created from that. And listen, this is Doubting Thomas. Okay? People still call him Doubting Thomas. No, Thomas became a man of faith. Because he said, my God is greater than your God. They, they, they have history. Church history teaches this. They, when they did that, he said, go ahead. They splashed the water up. And he commanded it to stand still in Jesus' name. And it froze in the air. And they all got saved. Because he demonstrated the reality through the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus is alive. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is not in the grave. He's not waiting to come up. He's already been raised from the dead. Glory to God. <clears throat> and not just raised from the dead. He lives and by the power of the Holy Ghost to demonstrate the reality of his resurrection. That's why we're to go in the world with the power of God, demonstrating the reality of the resurrection by people being healed, devils cast out, sick uh, ministered to, all kinds of deliverance, anything that God needs done in a person's life, the power of the Holy Ghost will work that for them. Amen. If we'll get rid of the weenie church. Amen. We don't need any more weenies in the church. Our name is not Oscar Meyer. We're a Holy Ghost church, not an Oscar Mayer church. Amen. 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 Somebody say amen. amen. Well, we don't believe that anymore. I've heard people preach, well, we need intelligent faith. No, we need supernatural faith. Amen. Did you not know that the Bible says that God would win the loss through the foolishness of preaching? Not through your intellectual articulation of theological perspectives where you have great insight into the nuances of language and history and archaeological evidence to convince somebody's mind. Because faith is of the heart. And God wants to reveal himself alive. Reveal himself real. Reveal himself in all of his power and glory. So that men and women are no longer bound and defeated and taken captive by Satan at his will and at his bidding. 
that they can come to a church instead of coming to church so that they can relieve their religious need and go out and drink wine after they get out of church or get together and have a, have a craft beer with the froth coming off and slap it together and talk about how great it is that they can be Christians and be intelligent Christians and drink and do all these things. No, because when the, when the crises of life come, that craft beer is not going to deliver you. When your child in the middle of the night needs a miracle from heaven, that wine is not going to deliver you. When you need miracles, signs and wonders, all that garbage is not going to do anything for you. But an encounter with the God of miracles, signs and wonders, when those things are going on in your house, so you can reach into heaven and bring heaven down into your house, praise God, and bring deliverance, hallelujah. <laughs> and you bring your children up in the way of the Lord. And when they're in Oklahoma and you're in North Carolina and you get a phone call from one of your daughters saying Shannon's in trouble. She, her hands are yellow. She's lethargic. She's got a high fever. We said, honey, take her to the emergency room. And after about three hours, the doctors finally come back out. And she gets, listen, she gets worse after she gets there. And they keep running tests and they don't know what it is. They first said they think it's spinal meningitis. And they come back out and they don't know there's something else. And they, huh? Cerebral hemorrhage. She's having a, that's, that's not the, they came back out and said she has a cerebral hemorrhage. These are not good things. But in that room, praise God, because we taught our children about the Holy Ghost and about faith and about believing God. You know, they're in there singing, I'm healed, I'm whole, by the, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Call Mama Cindy Duvall, and she's, she says, Jesse, everything's good, everything is fine. We're at home, we're praying in the Holy Ghost. And in about three hours, Shannon's up on the bed, sitting Indian style, singing, I'm healed, I'm whole. And the doctors come in and say, we don't have a clue what was wrong with her, but she's all right now. She's all right now. So she's all right now. And she, we gave her a little bit, they gave her a prescription for something, just, just to get, I think just to say with a piece of something, that they did something. They had no clue what they were dealing with. But I can tell you what they were dealing with. They were dealing with the, doc, the devils of the demons of hell coming to rob our family and to bring crush us and our church and anybody they could come in contact with. But I'm telling you, faith and the Holy Ghost, praise God, because, because they were able to believe and able to act on and able to receive. She's walking away. She's, she's, and mouthy as ever. I think she got more dose of a mouth. Yeah. I came close to death. I live by faith. Praise God, I got more mouth. <laughs> but this is what God wants to do in our lives. God wants to bring us up in the ways of faith. God wants to bring us up in the ways of the Holy Ghost. He wants you baptized in the Holy Ghost. Let me say something. The baptism of the Holy Ghost without word and faith doesn't work. You got to have both. Thank you. I hear people say, oh, yeah, I'm a word man. I'm a Holy Ghost man. You need to be a word and a Holy Ghost man. Yeah. Remember that the disciples couldn't minister food to widows unless they were full of faith. That comes from the Word of God and the Holy Ghost. Amen. They needed both. And we love, to, we love to major on the Word, and we do because we're, we're Word of Faith people. But we're also charismatic Pentecostals. I'm calling for, I'm calling, listen, church, we need to get full of the Holy Ghost like we've never been before. And we need to go out to the highways and byways and get this, this place full. Uh, did, they put out more, did they put out more chairs this week? Oh, they did. That's why it didn't look as full. Okay. Because we had some people not here and we got more chairs out. How many more chairs did they put out? Ten? Ten extra. Okay. So we're about as full as we were last week. Just more chairs out here. That whole front row needs to be out. We look fuller. And the gills need to be here. Then we're really full. We don't need, listen, we don't need to be happy to stay here. I don't mean this building, I mean this size. Now we're out of that place that you walked into and felt like you were walking into a barrel. 
that you were sinking in. We're out of there. This is a church reboot. We need to get the people and tell them what's going on. That's what I was going to say. We rode by the other place that don't believe anything, and the parking lot's full. And they're sitting there this morning being told that God is cosmic and God is dirt. And God is, you know, whatever you feel and God is another person. Whatever, whatever you choose for God to be, that is, that's how you worship. And the parking lot's full. And we have words of life, words of revelation. We have the anointing of God. And we need to get it to as many people as we can get it to. Why? Because lives need to be transformed. They don't need to be down, down there thinking that they're going to go to some kind of after. Some probably don't even believe in afterlife. And they're going to find out. And I don't say that with joy or glee or that we're the right ones. I'm saying we have got to get to humanity. And you've got to get filled back up with the Holy Ghost. You need to be full and overflowing. You need to be running on, you know, you know, what's that old, that old um, 70 song, Running on Empty? I forgot who, who sang that song, maybe Eddie Money or somebody like that. I forgot who did it. But Running on Empty. We need, listen, Shannon and I were coming in. We, we, got, we were a little bit later because we were running on empty. And I decided at, at, out there at the Sandy Ridge Road that I better get off and get to that little gas station and get $5 worth of gas because I'll be calling somebody saying, can you go get a gas can and come get us? I would have really been late. So we took an extra five minutes or so to get, get $5 worth of go juice. But too many churches, and our church can be in the same, we can get in the same place. We can get to where we're running on empty. When's God going to do this? When's God going to fill up with up? You're commanded. So get full. Spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. Get stirred up. Come with expectancy that God's going to do things. Bring people. Amen. We're going to get our sound system. It's going to be a little bit, a little bit. We're not going to have, we're not, we're not going to rock the walls. Yeah. That's not the purpose. It is to amplify and have it in a balance so that we can hear it. You, know, you can hear the voices. You can hear the, the instruments. Um, we'll even get the, the drum, the drum set back out. Because that's all one right. You just bring that thing and set it down. There's only one plug that plugs in with it. Okay, so we bring it in, set it down. There we go. Okay. We call ourselves charismatics. Charismatic comes from charisma, gifts. Actually, even a base word is charis, grace. Comes out, grace. Grace comes out of that same root. We are graced with an empowerment to reach. Greensboro needs what we have. We're not the only church. We're one of the churches that have something they, they need. They don't need what's going on up the road here. They don't need lies and deceptions. They need, they need encounters with God. People need to know that Jesus is alive. Somebody said recently, what, what's the difference between that and going to a mosque? Big difference. How many ever saw Raiders of the Lost Ark? Why did all the Muslims start standing up out there in the field when Harrison Ford came riding, Harrison Ford came riding by on the white horse? They thought it was Muhammad. They're waiting, for their, they're waiting for Muhammad to get up. Muhammad's not coming up. Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. And we are the church that needs to present that to humanity. But not with an argument of trying to convince them. The Apostle Paul presented his case to King Agrippa. And he looked at him and said, you almost, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Almost ain't good enough. Almost don't cut the mustard. Almost don't bring it home. Last week, if one call, one horrible call that was not overturned, and every announcer on ESPN and everywhere agrees, the ball never touched the ground. That game is completely different. What do you mean? Carolina's not down at the three-yard line having a tackle into the end zone for a touchdown. They're up at the 35-yard line. Even if they don't get a first down, Denver doesn't get a touchdown. Now, the last touchdown was late in the game. They were just trying everything they could. When you know, you get, when you know the quarterback's got a pass, you just, don't, you just don't even try to stop the rush. You just go. Because even if they rush, they're not going to win the game. Okay? That almost. That call it was, it was an almost. They almost 
were in a position. That and the stupid guy drops the ball at the three yard line. Overturn play, catch, Panthers are the Super Bowl champions. I got, I got so tired of hearing about the Denver defense and how great they were. Carolina's held Denver under 200 yards. Under two, only time a Super Bowl team is won with under 200 yards because of the, ba the bad call. This is not sour grapes. <laughs> it was horrible. It was a, you can play the violin all you want to. It was a hard. I mean, you got the announcers at ESPN the next day going, listen, everybody knows he caught the ball. Yeah, and I'm wondering that, where, where that guy's spending his vacation this summer, winter. <laughs> the official. He's on some island somewhere. You need to get big. <laughs> but I said all that because they were almost Super Bowl champions. Almost ain't good enough. It don't, it, you know, there's not a person in Carolina that's going, walk around just going, woo! We had a great season. They're all going, well, I had a great season, but, because it wasn't good enough. At that point, the only thing that was going to be, be quality, excitement was they won it. And one, two, three, three guys in little striped shirts took it away from them. I'm not bitter. But, but the fleas of a thousand camel infest their armpits. Anyway. <laughs> now, let's get back over here. That almost wasn't good enough. We can't have people almost getting to heaven. We've got to walk in the power. We've got to walk in the anointing. We've got to carry the gospel. And we've got to grow this church so we can reach more people. That's right. It's, it becomes exponential. I encourage you to spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. God will show you who to witness to. God will show you who to share with. God, I mean, start inviting people. Tell them, hey, you got to get over here. It's an exciting place. We're going to have a speaker system soon. So when they come in, they'll, be, they'll hear it out in the parking lot. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, we thank you for the service. Thank you the people are blessed. Walk in the light of your word. And we're going to walk full of faith in the Holy Ghost. And reach the loss for the kingdom. Change Greensboro. And the Piedmont Triad with the anointing and power of God so that humanity comes to know eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.